Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome again to Syriana Analysis. I'm your host, Kirk Almasian. Thank you very much for tuning in to today's live streaming, whether you are watching us on YouTube or on Rumble. I appreciate you all, guys. And just a disclaimer, while I said that this is a live streaming, but it was recorded a few hours earlier, because today I wanted really to host Professor Tim Anderson, and he lives in Sydney, and the time difference is too big. I think it's eight hours or 10 hours between us. Professor Tim Anderson is an academic director of Center for Counter-Hegemonic Studies. He's also an author of multiple books, including The Dirty War on Syria, which is about my country, The Axis of Resistance Towards an Independent Middle East, and the third one is West Asia After Washington Dismantling the Colonized Middle East. Professor Tim, thank you so much for being with me today on Syriana Analysis and dedicating your valuable time to me. I think it's a very important case to discuss with you. As I was uh, reading the comments about uh, the counter arguments of the Zionists against the Tucker Carson's interview with the Palestinian uh, pastor uh, from uh, Bethlehem, and I did some research and I came uh, across your article uh, that you published on Al Mayadeen in 2021, how Washington led the purge of Christians from its new Middle East. And I thought it's a, a the brilliant idea to discuss with you. So thank you so much for being with me today. Well, thank you for having me, Kavok. It's good to see you again. It's good to see you too. It's really a pleasure to have you. I just want to show uh, the audience like a three-minute uh, segment of this uh, interview between Tucker Carlson and the Palestinian pastor from Bethlehem, which uh, caused, uh, as we say in the street language, a shitstorm on social media platforms. And Tucker Carlson received so many accusations because of this. Let's take a look to this three minutes. If, if you wake up in the morning and decide that your Christian faith requires you to support a foreign government blowing up churches and killing Christians, I think you've lost the thread. It, it, just to, to end on this, if you had a message for Christian leaders in the United States, whether in government or in churches or just citizens who care about religion and their fellow Christians, what would it be? It would be to remind them that when the state of Israel was created, it was not created on an empty land. It was created on a land that had uh, millions of indigenous Palestinians there, including Palestinian Christians. And that that state they support, uh, that state they celebrated as a fulfillment of prophecy and the sign of God's state to the Jewish people for it to become a state. Uh, hundreds of thousands of Palestinians, including Palestinian Christians, uh, were forced to leave and have never returned. Uh, churches were closed. A friend of mine did the research and counted more than 30 churches that were closed when Israel was created because Palestinians uh, were expelled from uh, the land. Our numbers continue to be in decline. Uh, so we're pleading that uh, come and listen, come and talk to us. And my message to Christian leaders right now is there is a very, very brutal war taking place in Gaza, a war that I've described using the word genocide because it's a war that has used even starvation as a mean and fellow Christians are suffering because of that war. Uh, it's time that uh, Christian leaders uh, recognize that wars is not the way, whether in Iraq and Afghanistan and Libya. And, I mean, when will we learn that war does not help? When will we take Jesus's words seriously uh, about being peacemakers, about being merciful, merciful. there must be uh, other ways. Um, and so it would be an invitation to listen, to learn more, uh, and to avoid very shallow and simpli simplistic perspectives that are not based on scripture itself, but more based on uh, political uh, equations. Uh, and I would plea right now, and I will continue to plea that we need to stop this war in Gaza. Uh, it's killing many, many children, women, innocent lives. It has to stop. There must be uh, other ways. And as a follower of Christ, uh, we have to pursue the path of peace uh, and justice. And we have to avoid simplistic uh, polarizations, good and evil. Come and listen, come and understand what's happening. And I plead as a Christian pastor from Bethlehem, I plead that you come uh, and listen. Father, thank you for your thoroughly decent and sensible analysis, and I hope it's heard 
by Christians throughout the West. I appreciate it. So, uh, Professor Tim, isn't it telling that somebody had to play the Christian card uh, to trigger discussion in the United States after 33, 34,000 civilians being killed? The vast majority of them were, of course, uh, Muslims in the Gaza Strip. But somebody had to play the Christian card so that the American society um, is encouraged to speak about what's happening in Palestine first by Tucker Carlson now. And secondly, don't you think that this pastor is misled to think that the uh, Western leaders are Christians because he was talking to them as if they are heads of the cri Christian nations in, in, in the Western world? Yes, I think, uh, remember there was a reaction when uh, the Bush administration invaded Iraq and started talking about... Um, a, a crusading mission, and they realized this was perhaps uh, an unfortunate historical reference. You would know very well, Kavork, that under the Obama administration, um, there was a similar sort of discussion there because I think Obama had to admit that uh, President Bashar al-Assad in Syria was protecting the Christians from the Islamist groups which were aligned with all of the objectives of the US in Syria. And of course, we know that they were funded and armed and as Biden admitted in 2014 and 10 years ago now that all of uh, the US allies, close allies, were funding and arming uh, both the ISIS terrorist group and many other of the terrorist groups. And of course, they were extremely vicious against people they regarded as kufr or unbeliever or some sort of apostate sort of um, Arab people in Syria. So it's gone on in Iraq. It's gone on in Syria. You can say it's gone on in Lebanon to the extent that the majority of the Christian population there is now pro-resistance. And of course, in Palestine, including in, in Beit Laham, which I visited um, six years ago, um, there's been terrible repression of Christians and really an expulsion of Christians from the whole region. I know Pope Francis has spoken about this, but he was criticized in turn by a Syrian priest, a very old Syrian priest who said, why aren't you pointing the finger at the people that are doing this? It's not magic you know it's not it's not muslims because muslims and christians live together in that region in the in the mesopotamia and the levant for many many centuries and it's only in recent times that we've had this huge decimation of christian populations in iraq in syria um in lebanon to an extent and certainly in palestine and um really there hasn't been a good discussion about it so i think it's appropriate that it's raised but as you say uh, you know some of us feel a bit reluctant to say well why are we only concerned about Christian Palestinian lives? You know, what has it got to do with religion? You know, there are plenty of yeah. different minorities in Syria, for example. Why would we be elevating that? Maybe it's just to get the attention of Western regimes that nominally say, you know, I think Donald Trump also claims to be Christian of some sort. I'm not sure what type, you know, but they all have this, this nominal Christian sort of flag that they carry and they're not recognizing the great damage that's been done to Christian communities uh, across the whole region since the US-led wars have devastated the region, basically. And it's really quite systematic, as I tried to point out in, in my articles on al and which are now in that, that latest book, West Asia After Washington, that it, the US hand has been behind all of this, um, including Gaza, of course, where there's been a, a very small group of Christians, but nevertheless, a very historic group of Christians in Gaza, as well as the rest of the region. Exactly. This is the article, guys. Uh, I will also put the link of this article in the description below that you can on also read because uh, it also addresses the rise of ISIS and the responsibility of the United States in the spawn of ISIS. And that is very important because the persecution against the Christians uh, has increased after the spawn of ISIS and other terrorist groups. And we have to always address the, uh, the, the root cause of the issue. Who funded ISIS? Who started ISIS? And which, what conditions led to the emergence of ISIS after the occupation of Iraq in 2003? The regime changed war there. And then there was a vacuum of power. Uh, and when the resistance started to fight against the American there, the Americans had a quote unquote brilliant idea of supporting the sectarian death squads in Iraq in order to counter the resistance so that now they have a rivalry between the resistance and these sectarian death squads inside of Iraq. And this led into the emergence of uh, and the empowerment of ISIS, which also expanded later to Syria uh, because of another regime change war initiated by 
the United States. So there, there, there are traces that we have to speak about. But Professor Tim, you mentioned Bethlehem and you were in Bethlehem, right? And I'm going to uh, screen an argument that was made today by uh, David uh, Rabu. And he says, uh, David says, in this case, that Bethlehem, uh, is not controlled uh, by Israel. It's under the control of the Palestinian Authority. These churches and priests are threatened with their lives ante, uh, unless they tow the line. Same as in Egypt or Syria or everywhere, there is a religious minority in an Islamic territory. Had Tucker been interested in getting the answer to the question of how Israel treats its Christians, he would have spoken to Christians in Israel, but he isn't so he didn't. So there are multiple allegations here, one of which is Bethlehem is not controlled by Israel, but rather by the Palestinian Authority. And the second one is if this um, pastor doesn't say anything that is in line with the Islamic uh, version of the narrative, then his head would be chopped off probably, just like in Syria and in Egypt, he says. And Tucker had to interview a pastor in Israel and not in the Palestinian territories. Is Bethlehem controlled by Israel or by the Palestinian uh, Authority to begin with? Look, Bethlehem is in the West Bank, the occupied West Bank, and uh, it is controlled by the Southern Brigade, Brigade of the Israeli Occupation Forces, the ones that kneecap young men. And uh, they boasted to them that they're going to, uh, half of them are going to be crippled and the other half are going to be pushed around, around in wheelchairs. They're doing this, this type of uh, genocidal campaign by the that Israeli um, forces in Bethlehem um, and uh, in its outlying suburbs like Dehesha, for example, which is, a, which is an old refugee camp, uh, and in Hebron. Um, there's been great brutalizing of Palestinian youth over there. And of course, the only Christians in occupied in, in Israel, what you call Israel or 48 Palestine or occupied Palestine are Palestinians. Mm -hmm. Christianity is not recognized. There are no Israeli Christians, basically. There may be Christians in what they call Israel, but they're actually Arab Christians. So uh, mm -hmm. the Palestinian Authority, for the one thing, no, it doesn't brutalize Christians at all. The Palestinian Authority, for all its faults, is not an Islamic regime, nor is Syrian, the Syrian government, for that matter, an Islamic regime. And it's laughable to say that the Syrians are an Islamic regime that brutalizes Christians. Really, you know, if we go back to the, the even the Lebanese civil war in the, in the 70s and 80s, it was a great concern of Hafez al-Assad back there that there wasn't a... Uh, a conflict between Muslims and Christians in Lebanon because, of course, there were as many Christians in Syria as in Lebanon, basically, at that time. And um, um, anyway, there's, there's, a, there's a long history to that. And, and, and what yes. was happening was the French were trying to hang on to a, an artificial Christian majority, which they lost. And then um, the Israelis were trying to take advantage of that. But the Israelis have had a very strong hand in brutalizing the Christians in driving them out of the Christian villages. It was never, in recent times, it wasn't a high number. I think this man said it was something like 80%. I don't think for a very long time, Bethlehem has not been 80% Christian, but it was much higher than it is now, basically. And all of the major Christian towns there have been um, decimated effectively. The, and it's been because of the US wars and because of the Israeli hand. I'd like to say something yeah. else, if I may, about the Israeli, you know, the Israelis have a presence in Northern Iraq in Arabil. Yes. And this has been a source of um, conflict for um, Iraq, uh, federalized Iraq since the invasion, because the Iranians have not been very happy with terrorist groups being based in Erbil and attacking Iran. And that's been some Kurdish separatists that have been supported by the Israelis and the US in Erbil under the Barzani regime there in, in, in the north part of Iraq. Now, when I was in Kamishli in Syria a couple mm. of years ago, the former town council, which is still active, more or less underground there, under the separatist Kurdish regime in northeastern Syria, which, of course, is backed by the U.S. military there, um, and they're helping fund them by stealing oil and stealing wheat and so on like that. But the Commissioner Council say that there is this mission that the Israelis in Erbil have training the Kurdish separatists there, and they call it the Babylon Revenge. It's hmm. a type of, it's a strange sort of mythical thing that says, well, uh, we Jews were exiled back in the day, you know, into Mesopotamia, and it was the Assyrian Empire that did it to us. Of course, the Assyrian Empire wasn't Christian back then, but anyway, whatever. The Assyrians these days are almost entirely Christian. And so their revenge on the Assyrian Christians in Northeast wow. 
Syria is driven by a, a strange sort of mythical biblical um, idea that some of the Zionists have that it was the ancestors of the Assyrians who exiled the Jews from from Palestine supposedly it's all a myth basically but it really uh, is one of the explanations or rationales for why the Israelis are now helping the separatist Kurds drive the Assyrian Christians out of northeastern Syria and I might add from my point of view that's interesting because Australia received back in and it was revealed in 2018 um, a, a huge proportion of Syrian Christians as yes. refugees there um, before that you know with the the emigration from Lebanon for example during the civil war there was no real religious discrimination we got refugees from all the different religions but the then Australian Prime Minister was exposed in a phone call with the then President Donald Trump in the US as saying that at least 80% of all of the Syrians being received in Australia back then, six years ago, were Christians. And they were, they were coming all from that northeastern part of Syria, basically. So effectively, the US-backed Kurdish separatists were ethnically cleansing Christians from northeastern Syria, from Kamishli and the villages around Kamishli there. The Kurds had never been a majority in that part of Syria, but now they they put these maps up painted yellow and say that this is somehow Kurdish territory. Now, it's not Kurdish territory at all. The Syrian state is all through there. It's a very shallow occupation. But nevertheless, the Israelis have had a hand. I think that's interesting, not just in Palestine, but also in Iraq and Syria in uh, this sort of revenge, strange sort of biblical revenge against the Assyrian Christians in that part of the world. And of course, they've fled um, Iraq in big numbers because of ISIS, which was created, as you said, as a result of the in the in in the, the aftermath of the invasion and uh, the U.S. using the Saudis to create this extreme yes. so-called Sunni force, which was hostile to the Christians and to everyone else, uh, anyone supporting the Syrian state, for example. But the Israelis have have had a hand in that too. There is uh, uh, other arguments to this, uh, but I just want to say that uh, saying this. Um, when you speak about these uh, arguments, you are going to be accused of being an anti-Semite, right? And uh, similarly, now uh, Tucker, Tucker was accused, met, but by many big talking heads, like John uh, Potrovet said, anti-Semite filth to Tucker Carlson. And then we have uh, Richard Hanania. I just want to show what he wrote about this. Uh, he says that Israel is the only country in the region where a Christian pastor can complain about his government and keep his head. This would be good context to provide, but Tucker is an online influencer now, and anti-Semitism is what sells do you do you share the notion that after October seven uh, events and the attack of onslaught of Israel against the Palestinians of Gaza, and now after 33, 34 thousand Palestinians were murdered, the the weaponization of anti-Semitism is no more uh, impactful in the uh, sphere of public discussion about what's going on in Palestine or in the Middle East, like it lo lost its meaning and its uh, power, right? It it's no more a weapon against people. I agree. And I think the Zionists did it. They brought it on themselves, basically, because they wanted to push through um, through a variety of mechanisms that anti-Semitism was not really about some sort of historical prejudice or hatred against European Jews. It was against <laughs> Israel. And now... For example, you look at the Zionist groups in the US, uh, like the Anti-Defamation League, when they do surveys and they try and say, look, anti-Semitism anti is on the rise, what they're doing, drawing on this idea that uh, being anti-Israel is the same as being anti-Jew, uh, they are looking at all these young people in the US who are horrified at the genocide in Gaza. And of course, they're anti-Israel because they're anti-genocide. Any decent person is anti-genocide. And so... Uh, the people, even Jewish people going to rallies against the genocide and, you know, not in our name groups and the, the other groups that have been Jews against the occupation and so on. These are all anti-Semites carrying out anti-Semitic actions. And so when the Zionist groups add them up, they say, well, there's the big demonstrations against the genocide in Gaza. This is all anti-Semitism. Therefore, anti-Semitism is on the rise. So I think uh, the Zionists themselves have destroyed the meaning here. It is now a meaningless term. Uh, it means um, anti-Israel, basically. And of course, well, if anti-Semitism means anti-Israel, okay, I'm anti-Semitic, fine. Now, every mm -hmm. decent person should be anti-genocide and anti-apartheid for that matter. And, and let me point out that in terms of the six recent independent reports, uh, branding 
Israel as a, an apartheid regime. This comes from the sponsors, you know, from Amnesty International based in Britain, from Human Rights Watch based in the US, a number of other reports from uh, groups inside uh, 48 Palestine or Israel itself. Uh, the, the legal implications of an apartheid state is that it, there's a responsibility on the international community to dismantle it. It is a crime to recognize an apartheid regime. It should be dismantled. So there's, uh, they've destroyed the idea that there's any right of an apartheid regime to exist, and they've destroyed the difference between Jewish people and, and Zionists, and I think that they've brought that entirely on their own heads. It doesn't have the force anymore that it might have had some years ago. You know, I just want to say, uh, tell a personal story. Uh, I live in a neighborhood in Berlin, and when I moved to this neighborhood, um, somebody recommended me to register to a website uh, that I receive newsletters when the, um, the the people who live in the area, they meet to discuss about some, some topics. So I said it would be fine, so I can meet the people, you know, in, in the neighborhood. And uh, two days ago, I received an email uh, on this forum, and they say that they have to, they are going to meet in some cafeteria or in somewhere, and they're going to discuss the rise of anti-Semitism here in the neighborhood. <laughs> and I was like, oh my God, I have to go now to this, uh, to, to, to this forum and tell them about anti-Semitism and about occupation. But uh, discussing uh, these issues nowadays have become very, very toxic, you know, and I, 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 I really don't enjoy anymore uh, the discussion, the de debate about it, because um, they're trying to cancel uh, or uh, completely destroy discussion by canceling you, by saying you're an anti-Semite. Mm -hmm. and, and I know that I'm not an anti-Semite, so I don't care what they say about me. But Actually, you're, a semi, huh? you're a Semite, yeah. aren't you? Yeah, 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 yeah I mean... But their accusations have implications on on on, on me and and uh, on my career, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So it's a really uh, they're still trying to use it as a, a weapon whenever they can. But I see because I follow social media commentaries, people are increasingly don't uh, care anymore about this. Now there are two more arguments against this uh, interview, and I will show you what Carolyn uh, said in this regard. She says this is a man hit piece that shows Tucker's generally well-hidden hand. The Christian population of Bethlehem all but disappeared after the PLO took over in 1996 due to Islamic persecution. The only Christian population in the Middle East that is growing is the Christian community in Israel. The Christian community in Gaza disappeared after Hamas took over in 2005, and in 2002, the PLO terrorists took nuns and priests hostages in a standoff with IDF forces in the Church of of the nati uh, nativity in Bethlehem. And similarly, Mike, uh, Mike is also very uh, pro-Azerbaijan and pro-Israel. He says, this is stupid and uh, malevolent. Christians live far better in Israel than in any other surrounding countries. Palestinian rule, not Israeli, is what drove Christians from Bethlehem before the Israelis withdrew per the Oslo Accords. Christians thrived there. So it's the PLO who is to be blamed of kicking the uh, or the decrease of the numbers of the Palestinians in uh, Bethlehem and in West Bank in general. Look, uh, what can I say? The, the world is full of ignorant people, you know, and people have these illusions about uh, Israel, including some of the Israelis themselves, you know, but... Um, uh, do you really think this is ignorant or these people are like they're professional in what they do you know because i have the feeling that these people know what they're doing now after yeah, this big interview. information but uh, it, it is it is misinformation it could be this deliberate misinformation i mean hmm. the idea of the idea of the plo or the palestinian authority suppressing christians is just laughable really it's um it's uh absurd you know and and uh Okay, maybe there's some Christians in Israel who are tolerated and are, uh, you know, looked after. And of course, the the conditions of life, the infrastructure, you know, all of the services are certainly much better in in 48 Palestine, yes. as, as we say, or, or Israel. No doubt about that. And the conditions of life are very difficult in yes. anywhere in, in occupied Palestine. There's no doubt about that. But the the idea that they're being persecuted by the the Palestinian groups. I mean, really, the 
I, I know actually one thing about uh, visiting occupied Palestine is that you realize very quickly that the Palestinian Authority is not very beloved, and that mainly because they don't do yes. anything. They're seen as an arm of the Israeli state. They're seen as a municipality yes. that's taking out the rubbish and collaborating with the Israelis. I mean, that's really the main sin of the Palestinian Authority you will hear from people, whether it's in Bethlehem or anywhere else, basically. They're not well liked. I mean, the, the polls recently show that... Um, the vast majority of Palestinians want want uh, Abu Mazen Mahmoud Abbas, the, the so-called president, to resign. He hasn't been elected in a very long time. So, yes. but you know, no one, no one. I haven't heard anyone accusing him. And I spoke to people in in uh, the suburbs of of Bethlehem. It's not uh, the case at all. They are brutalised directly by the Israeli military, which is really um, one young man I spoke to in Dahesha suburb was part of a reading group um, a few years before. And all of his friends are either in prison or dead. And if you look up on the internet, anyone can look up and see all of the young men crippled um, by being shot in the kneecap or in the legs by the Israeli military in Dahesha in particular, in Hebron also. They will see that there's a, you know, there's there's huge, uh, you know, hundreds of young men who've been crippled in this way by the by the Israelis. And the, the Israeli armed forces have no interest in Christians or, or Muslims. They're really concerned. They consider all of the Palestinians to be, you know, uh, as they've said in Gaza, they consider them all to be potential terrorists, you know, breeding terrorists. That's why they, they printed these T-shirts, you know, with, with pictures of um, snipers shooting a, a pregnant Palestinian woman, you know, two yes. with one shot and children, you know, shooting children. They joke about it. They laugh about it openly, you know. The idea yes. that then somehow there's some um, deference to Palestinian Christians is just absurd. Yes. They've been brutalized just the same as every other Palestinian. Uh, uh, Professor, you remember at the beginning I screened this and I said, uh, uh, this guy says Bethlehem is not controlled by Israel, it's under the control of the Palestinian Authority. And then uh, Dan Cohen, he's a Jewish uh, uh, journalist, he says, I took these photos of Israeli occupation soldiers yucking it up and shooting at Palestinian children in 2014 when I lived in Aida refugee camp in Bethlehem. Israeli raids into the city occur on a near daily basis with the full cooperation of the Palestinian Authority, which is a tool of Israel and has no authority. In other words, you are a liar. And he posted some photos. As you mentioned, this guy is laughing here and they are basically just shooting kids here in, in their legs and... Uh, like just like you mentioned right and mm -hmm. uh, those are all documented on photos and on videos nowadays it's undeniable and it's so documented that uh, the, the their argument cannot even stand uh, any rational discussion uh, and therefore when you watch these mainstream media outlets who try to host both sides of the story, you see that they always try to host, uh, for example, this Dershowitz uh, from the other side or someone who is really, really radical in order to push the other side also into either radicalization or just to uh, disturb the discussion because they don't want uh, clear-headed and calm discussion because in any calm discussion situation the facts are there you can lay it down and everybody can see what's happening in uh, whether in gaza or in palestine uh, overall um i would i would like to just mention last one one last thing about these arguments against this uh, interview made and this was made uh, apparently by someone whose name is dr malouf i don't know who is he and he says in gaza sharia is the law of the land christians have no rights in the west bank the christian population in places like bethlehem declined by 90 percent after the palestinian authority took over in iraq and syria the christian population has been almost entirely ethnically cleansed but they don't mention why in Egypt, Christians are treated as second-class citizens. And then, he says, in Lebanon, Hezbollah is threatening to commit genocide against, against the Christians as we speak. <laughs> I mean, uh, as, far, as far as I remember, last time Hezbollah was liberating the Christian towns and villages in Syria and also on the Christian uh, towns on the borders between Syria and, and, and Lebanon when ISIS attacked. Well, we know we know how the Lebanese vote, and we know that most of them vote for groups that are aligned with Hezbollah these days. You know, <laughs> um, I mean, that this is, Hezbollah has been in government for the last decade, basically, and usually with the Free Patriotic uh, Movement, which is uh, a progressive group which supports the resistance and 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 works very closely with Hezbollah. The, the fascists there are the the, the Jaja group, you know, the Lebanese forces, which are 
getting now getting funded from the Saudis after the future movement mm. proved unreliable. But if you want to see, if anyone wants to see the popularity of Hezbollah with Christians, have a look at some of the concerts, the live concerts of Julia Boutros. And you yeah. see the audience is mainly, they're mainly Christian, very few hijabi women there basically. And and Julia Boutros is singing about the resistance. She's singing songs with the words of Hassan Nasrallah in it. We have a look at the Christians going wild um, because of the, the role that Hezbollah played in expelling the Israelis in 2000 and 2006. And of course, uh, many Christians in the south of Lebanon in particular um, worked very closely with and still work very closely with the resistance groups in Lebanon, particularly Hezbollah. Actually, I, I also wanted to ask you, when Hezbollah fought against these terrorist groups like ISIS, Nusra, and the rest who, who were supported by the CIA and the Pentagon in, uh, in Syria, and mm -hmm. these terrorist groups attacked Lebanon as well, multiple times, and they attacked Hezbollah strongholds, and they call it as Hezbollah stronghold, like uh, it's in Dahiyeh, it's in the southern suburbs of Beirut, for example, and multiple car bombs came and they uh, completely destroyed uh, certain uh, neighborhoods and mm -hmm. who was giving also aid to these groups you may ask and many people are wondering and i just want to show them like uh, this was all revealed like in 2017 when donald trump ended the regime change war and there was so many talk in the administration and also in israel then the reports started to come out like israel gives secret aid to syrian rebels and they are they call them rebels so they used to receive cash money uh, weapons and humanitarian uh, aid as well and uh, i'm I, they there are many, many of these um, uh, articles, actually, for one of which is from uh, Israeli uh, newspapers. For example, in the uh, Times of Israel, the IDF chief finally acknowledges that Israel supplied weapons to Syrian rebels. And those are not from pro-Hezbollah or, let's say, pro-Syria accounts. Those are from the mainstream media itself. And we have, for example, this article from the foreign policy said inside Israel's secret program to back Syrian rebels. And this was written by Elizabeth uh, Turkov, and she was captured a few months ago yeah. in Iraq uh, as a Mossad agent there, and yeah. she's still being held for that. So right. Israel, in this case, supported the quote-unquote Syrian rebels. You... Mm documented the Syrian war extensively. I've been speaking about it extensively as well. But in mm. your view, who were the Syrian rebels? And have they had any negative impact on the presence of the Christian community in Syria? Oh, absolutely. They, um, I mean, if you, um, some people may have heard of the town of Malula in, in, uh, in Syria, in Western Syria, which is um, near the border of Lebanon, um, in the mountains there. And um, if you go there, the, the, particularly the priest in the lower church. There's an Orthodox church and there's a Catholic church up at the top of the hill there. Um, the, the, the priest in the lower church will show you a letter from Hassan Nasrallah in 2006, thanking the people of Malula for taking in Lebanese refugees when Israel invaded South Lebanon. And then he will tell you also that when the uh, Jabhat al-Nusra, one of the, the early incarnation of one of the Al-Qaeda groups there, which has changed its name a couple of times. But when they invaded Malula and kidnapped some nuns there, it was young Muslim men from Lebanon that came to defend Malula. And he'll make a point of, of, of pointing that out to you, that it was young Muslim men from Hezbollah who came to help liberate the town, help the Syrian army liberate the town of Malula, because, of course, yes. the Syrian army and Hezbollah were cooperating all along that mountain, there, all along the Kalamun mountain there, where there was um, some traffic of those groups. So... Uh, Jabhat al-Nusra was the branch of al-Qaeda, which um, which terrorized anyone who supported the government, really. Of course, they hated the minorities. They claimed to be representing Sunni Muslims, but really they just hated yes. anyone who supported the government, basically. They did horrific things um, to civilians from all religions, including Sunni Muslims, you know, really. But they particularly hated the, the, the minority groups. And Syria, for centuries, has been a haven for minorities, you know. Armenians, you know, Assyrians, um, Alawi, Druze, uh, Christians, you know, a couple of million Christians at some stage. So minorities, but nevertheless, yes. some of them were bigger than others, you know. So uh, that was Jabhat al-Nusra. They are now basically led by the same guy, Jolani, now called uh, HTS, and they're the ones in Italy. By the way, there's a famous Syrian film director called Najdat Anzur, who is... Mm, uh, yes, I know him. 
produced a film called Broken Crosses, which is about the destruction of Christian uh, churches in Idlib, which is still yes. about two thirds occupied by this group, HTS or, or, or Jabhat al-Nusra, which is proscribed by the UN Security Council as a terrorist group. And of course, they collaborated with ISIS at different times and had some territorial disputes, but basically ISIS was the same sort of sectarian uh, group backed by the by Na by the NATO powers, by US and its allies, backed by uh, Erdogan's Turkey, backed by the Saudis, of course, backed by Qatar. I believe Qatar is the now still the major funder of HGS in Idlib. So yes. all of those atrocities um, against minorities were were the trademark, if you like, of those sectarian terrorist groups, which were used by the US, as Joe Biden admitted um, 10 years ago, and as General Martin Dempsey and, and Senator Lindsey Graham admitted, they were set up and financed and armed precisely to overthrow the Syrian government. They yes. failed in that. And, and then, of course, the US decided to replace ISIS with the, this um, so-called Syrian Democratic Forces, which are Kurdish separatists with their leadership from Turkey, basically, because the whole Kurdish separatist issue in Turkey is quite a distinct thing from that in Syria, Iraq, or, or Iran for that matter. But nevertheless, it was a useful tool, uh, the Kurdish card for the US to use in trying to divide and weaken all of those countries, Iran, Iraq, Syria, and of course, um, uh, also to a degree, Lebanon, because as you pointed out, those groups were, were fighting in Lebanon. It was yes. Hezbollah that defeated them in, in Lebanon. They never attacked uh, the Israelis. Uh, I think there was one stray rocket that went into the Israeli-occupied Syrian Jolan, and they apologised yeah. to the Israeli court. And the Israeli leaders said, you know, we'd rather have ISIS in control in Syria than uh, yes. the current yeah. regime, which is actually not a religious regime. The Ba'ath Party regime in Syria is actually committed to their idea of secularism, which is a type of pluralism, basically. And they've always been very good to the Christians. And the Christians, as President Obama admitted many years ago, were protected by Assad and, and revered in many respects. Um, you know, there was a good, very good relationship between the Assad government and the Christians in Syria. You know, so it's just mendacious for them, for these Zionists to say these stupid things about Islamic regimes chopping off Christians' heads. It's just <laughs> doesn't sit with none of the Christians in Syria will tell you this. You know, I've met many yes. of them. Christian leaders, none of them will say that to you. And in fact, there have been US personalities who've gone to, you know, independent people like Tulsi Gabbard and some other journalists who've gone and interviewed Christian leaders there and they've said all the same thing. So what's exactly. going on with this here is, is just rubbish. Actually, um, I, I'm a Christian from Syria and uh, we know what happened in the country for the past uh, decade and two and we know who supported these so-called rebels and what did they did to the people and for what purpose and how they emptied the country from its Christians and also the Armenians. And as we speak now, the Armenian community in Jerusalem, for example, they're calling on Christian communities around the world to pressure Israeli government because the uh, Zionist uh, settlers are taking over the Armenian uh, quarter and they are going to again, cleans the area now from the Armenians uh, in, in Jerusalem, which is an occupied Palestinian territory. So for those uh, who are still uh, speaking of um, the Israel's uh, protection of the Christians, the Armenians are also Christians. And uh, I spoke to the representatives of the Armenian uh, uh, Jerusalem community in, uh, in Jerusalem, and I hosted them on Syrian Analysis. You can find this uh, interview also in the live streamings. And they are uh, telling a different story. Uh, mm -hmm. about the Israeli position on the Christians. And it also it reminds me of the statement of uh, uh, Georgia Meloni, the current prime minister of Italy, before she came to power in 2018. Of course, the, all of them are honest before they come to power. And uh, she said, if it's still possible to defend the existence of the Christian community in Syria, it is thanks to the government of Bashar al-Assad, Russia, Iran, and the Lebanese Hezbollah. This is what she said before she came to power. I'm quoting her. But unfortunately, now these things are taboo and you cannot really speak about them. You have to thank Israel for protecting the Christians. <laughs> I think I think there's probably a, a widespread perception that Iran somehow, because it is an Islamic state um, or, or a combined democratic Islamic state, that somehow those sort of things that the Zionists are saying are true of Iran, but actually Iran has a thriving Armenian community, uh, particularly yes. Isfahan, which I visited some years ago, and there's a, there's a, a museum to the Armenian Holocaust under the Ottoman Empire, there's a big bank cathedral there, a very elaborate cathedral. There's a thriving community with music and all sorts of things in Isfahan. So, and I believe um, they, 
also enjoy some of the benefits of the reserve seats in the Iranian parliament too. So the, the Armenian community is spread all through the region, but they got a safe haven in Iran as they did in Syria, basically. And of, of course, the, there are communities in Lebanon also, and I believe in Palestine. I don't know to what extent they are in Palestine, but they were, you know, they sought refuge where they could and where they thrived really was yes. Iran and Syria. Yes. Actually, the Armenian Genocide um, uh, Church and the uh, where the Armenians every year on the 24th of April go to commemorate the Armenian Genocide in there is a where most of the ethnic cleansing of the Armenians happened by the back then Ottoman Empire. This church and the all the monuments were destroyed by a Nusra Front, uh, which was uh, backed by Turkey, and Turkey is a NATO country, and they com completely de disseminated, completely destroyed the, the 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 area. So they're also erasing the civilizational marks, the cultural marks in Palmyra, in Derizor, in Malula. This was not. Well, this is not coincidence. Those are not coincidences, in my opinion. Targeting uh, the history of Syria was all on purpose. And now we have, unfortunately, mouse pieces on different social media platforms trying to distort what happened in Syria, in Iraq, in Lebanon, in Palestine. Um, and those people sit in Washington, D.C., and they haven't been uh, to our countries. And we, the locals of these countries, we say something different. And they come and tell us that we are lying about mm -hmm. this case. And uh, because I made the point yesterday that as a Syrian Christian, I am not allowed to go to Bethlehem, to the Christian holy sites, mm -hmm. uh, just like my grandparents used to do. Before the 1967 war, which was initiated by Israel, not by the Arabic countries as they claim, um, Israel occupied Bethlehem, and since then, the m m my grandparents, my parents, and my generation, we are unable to go there. Before that, my grandparents used to go to Bethlehem for Hajj, as we say in Arabic, um, and then they had a tattoo here on their arm on the exact date and the year and the and the day that they were there in Bethlehem. And I seen that tattoo on the on the arms of many of the older generation in Aleppo, in the Armenian community, in the Christian community. And now we are unable to go there. And then some of the Christians from the United States come and tell me, you're a liar because I'm a Christian from the United States and I'm able to visit Jerusalem. Bro, you hold the uh, American passport. <laughs> I cannot go to Bethlehem because Israel, you, you are unable to go to the Palestinian territories without landing in an Israeli airport or passing through an Israeli Israeli a checkpoint, and they uh, they don't they block the Syrian passport holders from going there, right? So I don't know. Who borders, you know, so uh, I'm lucky in a sense that um, even if you're an uh, Arab, you can if you have an Australian passport, you can go there, but they will check you out. They will yes. look at your social. They will look at your social media. Uh, I got in once. I'm sure I wouldn't get in again because of my social media profile. You know, but they were very suspicious. The fact that I had visas for Iran and Syria in my passport. Mm -hmm. I said, well, I'm an academic. I go and study these places. And in the end, they let me in. But they give you a slip of paper. They don't stamp your passport um, yeah. because, as they know, that 30-something countries don't want to accept anyone with a passport that, that even, even has an Israeli stamp in it because uh, there are many states in the world, like Malaysia, for example, Indonesia, that simply won't tolerate um, people that collaborate with the Israelis. Mm. Professor Tim Anderson, this was a really, um, I enjoyed this discussion with you. Thank you really for coming to my show and uh, explaining these important issues. It's very important. Guys, uh, just few disclaimers or few notes. Uh, the X account of the team is in the description, but most importantly, the three books that I mentioned are also in the description below. The last one is from the website, not from Amazon, right, uh, Tim? I ju was just checking. You can get it from uh, Amazon, publish. but uh, the, the publisher, I gave you the publisher link, but it's also uh, on Amazon. Cool. Yeah. Okay, I will put all the links in the description below, guys. Purchase uh, whatever book you like, and it's very important uh, to read uh, from the perspective of a professor and academic who was actually in the region many, many times, and he had uh, lengthy discussions with the people uh, there. That would be great. And 